Hmm. I don't see anything. I'm just going to go in the other room. Delay. Yeah, good. Yeah, Hello, everybody. We don't know that we're live, but we are. So, hello. I'm Jacqueline uh, Delahar, and I serve as the Executive Director of Underscore. Welcome to Voice. Um, if you don't know Underscore, it is a team with a focus on investigative reporting and Indian country coverage. Our work is done in partnership with other media. Sometimes it's complex arrangements, sharing editors, designers, lawyers, and publishing platforms. And other times it's simply reporting a story and editing and sharing with our news partners, both local, national, and with tribal media. Underscore is a nonprofit and relies on donors and foundations for support. And if you're watching this on YouTube, the link to donate is in the description. Please don't hold back. Um, and for those who have already made a donation, many thanks. Underscore is based in Portland, Multnomah County, and I want to give a land acknowledgement now uh, before we get started. Um, we should never forget, and I'm going to read this, we should never forget that the land on which we stand, and indeed, this entire area of the confluence of the Columbia and Willamette Rivers, is the traditional homeland and fishing and gathering range of tribes throughout the region. Its wealth of resources sustained indigenous people who lived here both year round and seasonally. These tribes have honored, protected, and stewarded these resources for thousands of years and continue to do so today. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the peoples who have cared for it since time immemorial. This calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we all call home. We want to give more visibility as well to the incredibly diverse local urban native population that is composed of people from more than 380 distinct tribal affiliations. Um, I'd like to also thank our sponsors who made this uh, series possible, uh, the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation and two Oregon Community Foundation funds, the Fred Fields Fund and the Leadings Fund. We are honored to receive support that in turn goes directly to Indigenous and Black writers like the speakers in the series we are launching tonight. The idea for this series emerged from a simple question, how do we better amplify the voices of ethnic media in America? And from another perspective, what does it take to be heard if you are a writer of color? Well, most American media organizations do not reflect the diversity of the nation or even the communities they cover. That leaves many of us in the dark about who we are as a country. Those voices have been missing all along. And as we all know, traditional media is in trouble. The good news, I think, is the growth of the nonprofit journalism sector. This is public service news that relies on the familiar business model of public broadcasting, donor supported, foundation funded, built on the strong tenets of journalism, fairness, accuracy, transparency, and trust. Tonight, we present three speakers who will try to answer our questions, speaking from their life experiences and professional work in film, television, newspapering, and books. And here's how tonight will go. I'll introduce you to the moderator, Walter Middlebrook, and he in turn will introduce our two speakers. The three of them will address the issues before us, and if you have questions, please add them into the Zoom chat along the side. And at around 7 or 6.50 uh, Pacific time, um, all of those questions will be given to Walter and he will talk to, uh, they'll talk as a group. And um, at 7 o'clock, we'll adjourn on the dot. So, Walter. I'm not sure how I met Walter, but in the news business, at least in the East, a lot of people knew him. We worked together on a new nonprofit, the Metcalf Institute for Marine and Environmental Reporting. I was the executive director and he was an advisory board member. Um, Walter is modest, thoughtful, 
and super funny, even though it doesn't look that funny right now, but you'll see. And plus inexplicably, he wears ties even when he doesn't have to. You'll see in a minute, but you can see right now. <laughs> Walter has worked at many major newspapers, including the New York Times and Newsday, where he is part of a team that won the Pulitzer for Spot News. He has earned a reputation as a consummate professional and a valued mentor for many young and aspiring journalists. He is currently an esteemed professor of practice at the Pennsylvania State University, where I imagine he is an excellent teacher. He is certainly a superb listener. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Walter. Thank you, Jack Lane, for that wonderful introduction. Too much over the top, but we'll let you go with that. Uh, but let me also thank you and Underscore for allowing me to be a part of this opening salvo of the series, looking at the role of the voice of the indigenous and black writers. For tonight's program, we're joined by two nationally renowned authors who will explore the topics Jacqueline has announced in the line. It's with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce the authors, Theodore C. Van Alstadt Jr. and Lolis Eric Eli. Theodore Van Alstead Jr. is chairman of the Department of Indigenous Nations Studies and director of the School of Gender, Race, and Nations at Portland State University. His novel, Sacred Smokes, a compilation of stories about a Native American growing up in Chicago, was the winner of the 2019 Tilly Olson Award for Creative Writing. He also has compiled a collection of writings of Stephanie Graham, Stephen Graham Jones, bringing home many of the works of this noir writer into the mainstream. That collection, titled The Faster Redder Road, The Best Un-American Stories of Stephen Graham Jones, and Sacred Smokes were both published by the University of New Mexico Press. Professor Van Alts is the creative editor of Transmotion, a journal of postmodern indigenous studies and an active member of the Horror Writers of America. Remember that. His fiction has been published in the Raven Chronicle, Red Earth Review, the Journal of Working Class Studies, and Yellow Medicine Review, among others. And Professor, if you don't mind, I'll be calling you Ted tonight. Is that cool? All right. Also with us tonight is Lolis Eric Eli, a Los Angeles-based writer and filmmaker who proudly presents and loves his hometown of Nolens, Louisiana. He spent more than a decade as an opinion columnist for the Times Picayune newspaper in New Orleans. And then he recently joined the writing staff of the Amazon series, The Man in the High Castle. Before that, he wrote for the series Greenleaf, which aired on OWN Channel, on the OWN Channel, and the series Treme, which aired on HBO. Working with the award-winning director, Don Lawson, he co-produced and wrote the PBS documentary, Obag Oborj. Treme, the untold story of Black New Orleans. His essay, American's Greatest Hits, is included in the Best African American Essays 2009 edition. Lois Eli is the author of Smokestack Lightning, Adventures in the Heart of Barbecue Country, and co-producer and writer of Smokestack Lightning, A Day in the Life of Barbecue, a documentary based on the book. He is editor of Cornbread Nation 2, the best of Southern food writing. And if you don't mind, I'll be calling you Lois for the rest of the evening. No okay? All right. <laughs> okay, with that in mind, let's get this discussion started. Uh, I want each of you to give us your individual thoughts on writing and where it fits into voice. And, and that's how we get into this time. So we'll start with you, Lois. Okay. Well, as you said, uh, the job that I've held the longest in my sort of varied career was as a Metro columnist for the Times Picayune in New Orleans. And it took a while for me to find my voice in that context, not so much because of a, a sort of confusion on my part, as it took a minute for me to solidify a sort of conception of what it meant to be a black columnist, in fact, the second black Metro columnist in that paper's 150 year history. And the two books that helped me come to a kind of understanding about this the first one was published in 1911 by a man named Rodolphe de Dune. It's called Our People, Our History. And what de Dune was writing about was the history of resistance in the Black Creole community dating back to the Civil War. And in fact, it was very helpful to us in creating our documentary about New Orleans, which was about the civil rights movement of the 1860s, which had largely been forgotten 
even when he was writing in 1911. At that point, the people who had been writing the black newspapers in New Orleans during the Civil War, after the South lost New Orleans to the North, those people who had had such high hopes for American democracy had had one last gasp in 1896. They brought Plessy versus Ferguson to the Supreme Court. When they lost that case, they were all but forgotten. And even in New Orleans now, when we talk about Black History Month, it's always about Martin Luther King and that later history because it was successful. But I felt that these stories of people fighting against these odds, despite the fact that they lost more often than they won, were important stories to tell. In a similar way, there's a book called In Search of Buddy Bolden by Don Marquis. And Buddy Bolden is arguably the inventor of jazz. And of course, that's a hyperbolic term, but that's the, that's the way in which he's become known. And he appeared in the Times Picayune on two occasions. Once when he attempted to kill his mother-in-law, and the other was when he died. But jazz is the signature of New Orleans now. And the idea that the paper of record didn't understand its community well enough to write about that man in the heyday of his revolutionary musical activity says something about the imperfections of daily journalism or of American media more broadly. The idea is that we could not rely on people outside the community to set the priorities for the stories the community wishes to tell. So much of what I sought to do in my work was find those community organizations, those community efforts, often people and organizations that didn't have the PR armory to get to a newspaper columnist and make a case for why a story should be written. And I decided these are the kind of stories that I wanted to tell. Indeed, when Don Lawson and I made Fulberg Treme, the untold story of Black New Orleans, much of what we wanted to do was remind people that there was a long history of struggle in this community. We had almost completed that documentary when Hurricane Katrina hit. At that point, we had to retool it because no one wanted to hear anything about New Orleans that wasn't related to the failures of the federal levy. But in a strange way, that was sort of a stroke of luck for us because actually, we found is that the questions in the 1860s and 1870s after the Civil War were the same as the questions in 2005 and 2006 after the federal levy failures. Who would be educated? Who would be allowed to vote? Who would be allowed to own land? The fact that I could go back to Rodolphe de Dune's book and get a sense of these struggles was crucial to me. So what I have set as my goal is to make my own decisions about what's important and to give voice to those people in the community who often would not otherwise have voice as a means of setting an agenda that may not necessarily be the agenda of my newspaper or your television station or your other outlet. I do that in part because I'm confident that these stories in the community, even if they're not recognized right now, are indeed crucial and do indeed warrant the greater scrutiny that the, the mainstream media often fails to give them. I was lucky in that I was writing for the major daily newspaper. So there was not, it was not difficult for me to have my voice heard or my picture seen by people in the city three days a week. So that is in some ways a different story from people who are writing um, from outlets that are, are not as well known or people who are writing about national issues when obviously there's, certain, certain, um, there's a lot of media on the national stage. We're also lucky though, because the possibility of finding niche media now is greater than ever, which means that we need to be certain that we're telling stories as well as you, we can tell them in a way that will connect with people. We need to be very much aware of the power of story to move hearts and minds in a way that facts and figures often do not. And thus it's important not merely to opine or do research between one's own ears, but rather to do research by talking about the people whose stories you want to tell and whose struggles are most germane to where we are today. So I would urge you in attempting to define your own voice is first of all, define what's important to be said. Once you realize the importance of what you have to say, I believe the voice will follow and follow easily and the audience as well. 
and Jacqueline Walter, I appreciate you giving me this time to speak about an issue that I think is crucial to all of us at this point. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great um, that's a great foundation for us to operate from. Um, Ken, what do you got to? What 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 is your found voice in here? You're, you're muted, Ted. I can see that I'm muted. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and thank thank you for that that. Uh, Generous introduction, Walter, and thank you, Lola's, for uh, for sharing those words. Um, and Jacqueline and the folks here at the at, at, at the foundation are giving us a shot at, at talking about these stories. Two things come to mind when you're talking, uh, Lola's. One of them, you're talking about voice. You know, it takes a while to find your voice. I didn't. I I mean, I was like, like I've been a writer, but not an author my whole life, right? So I didn't really publish anything until until much later in life. Uh, my my uh, novel actually came out when I was 53, right? So I was thinking about, about, uh, about how voice, uh, about how we find that voice and how voice comes to us. And so in the acknowledgments for the second book, I, I have a, a little shout out to, to Miles Davis who said, man, sometimes it takes a long time to sound like yourself, right? So that I think is really important that you've got to be centered and under and, and, and understanding of your voice and your, and your place with that voice and what it, what it means once you finally start to put pen to paper. Um, and the first book that I put, it, put in an acknowledgement to James Allen McPherson, who I met when I was a, a, just going to school and like the one class I remember taking, cause I, I ended up dropping out and then going back much later, but he came to visit our English class um, he was at Iowa, and so I was like Western Illinois, and we just started having a conversation that kind of made the professor mad because we were just having kind of a one-on-one -on -one conversation about writing that was really exciting. But he said something to me about writing because I was like, "What's your advice for writing?" What you know, when I was thinking about being a writer in my twenties, like in a serious way, and he said, "When you write, you have to write like the thing that you're saying is the most important thing being said on Earth at that moment." And I was like, okay, no big deal, right? But actually it is a big deal. It's a way to think about the importance of what you're saying, right? And to, to measure and to weigh uh, what, you're, what you're putting out there. So when I think about those, those things and, and what voice means, um, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with voice, but there's a lot about, I think, putting your voice uh, in authentic ways. And Lois, you're talking about like these, like the stories and, and the need to tell the stories correctly and accurately from community. And I think that's a really, that's a really big part of it. When I, when I te even teaching native lit in class um, and talking to students and what is it about this, right? Because they're, they're enthusiastic for the most part, they really like, you know, native lit and what is it about the literature and the, and the, the selections that I have and they're like, it's authentic, you know, they come, Back to that again and again about authenticity is something that really counts for them that really means something and I think when we're trying to get those stories out and then write those stories better write those stories the best we can to reach broader audiences it's that authenticity that's really important right and so in looking at writing like Walter mentioned I'm a horror writers uh, association person I write horror stories I write a lot of different things well, writing a horror story is completely different from, from, from writing like books, right? So I write about Chicago. I write about growing up in Chicago. Um, uh, I write about, you know, working class concerns, all those kind of things. When I write those stories, those, those just, I can't stop them. I have to turn them off. I have to go to bed. I have to turn those stories off because those stories are just like galloping to be told, right? When you're making up a story, hopefully you're making up horror stories unless, you know, some, <laughs> yeah, that kind of life. Uh, it's a different it's a different process, right? So creating something whole cloth is completely different from sort of remembering or giving space to those voices that want to be heard. And when you do that, I think you do that in authentic ways, it sort of transcends when you're writing. And um, I know there's a lot of focus on journalism, but I know there's two, there's some really smart native journalists that are going to come after me. So I'm not going to talk about that, but I, I do want to talk about, about the writing. And so Thinking about that, thinking about about working class concerns, those are really important. And then for me, the second book, um, Sacred City, is about Chicago again, 
where the uh, the narrator is much more aware of their place in the world, but it's also the, the sub dedication is to all the Indians who will not be ghosts, right? And so to me, it's about understanding Chicago as as during me said that that Chicago is Indian country too, right? That this big city was always a native place before the colonials showed up, before De Sable showed up, before it was changed into, into what it is now. It was always a place of meeting. It was always uh, a, a metropole, right? A place that, that drew folks in. And it's really important to understand um, for Chicago specifically, but for America more broadly, that underneath everything that we see here is native land, right? It's really important to understand that um, you're never going to understand the future of America unless you understand its past. And part of that is knowing what it's built on. So I really wanted to make sure that that was something um, that was part of this book. And in the audience response, a lot of people were like, yeah, I, I could see that. You know, the, one of the uh, other awards that it got that was really important to me was from a group called In the Margins. And In the Margins works with young folks. Um, you know, I think they're like 12 to 21 youth right young folks and youth are in the system right they're either on parole or they're locked up or they're you know on probation however their uh their entry into the system is and they get them in, engaged and involved in reading they gave them sacred smokes they gave them this book and and so the judges were like these kids love this book they're like the native kids are like yeah but the she said the, the the black and brown kids were like yes they walk like us talk like us look like us they have the same concerns as us and I think that's really important that to to understand America to understand concerns that are that are class but but cut across uh, color and ethnicity and all of that is really an important thing to know for us moving forward so to me the the two awards the the Working Class Studies Association and Tilly Olson who was a just an amazing artist. Um, but also uh, that one from in the margins, right? And so speaking uh, those stories for, for young folks to understand that, that um, just because you grew up in the city and just because you grew up in a, in a certain way that you can, you can love art, that you can love music, that all of these things can be important in your life is really uh, a subtext of the book. And, and the reviewers that, that picked up on that, I was happy for, but the young folks that got it, that meant everything. Am I out of time, Walter? I don't want to talk too much, so I want to keep. Uh, you know, we're, we're good. For, you're good. You, you're good. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, kind of a really great foundation, and I'm going to hit both of you. Um, I, I want. I'm, I'm kind of tossed between going in two directions. One is just how do you know when you find your voice uh, was one direction I want to go. But now that you brought up the book, and since Lola's, Lola's brought up his, uh, his the film, there's a that authentic authenticity that you two are talking about. Um, can you take a few minutes just to talk about the um, sacred smokes and, and what it means and, and about the book? And Lo Lois, I would like for you to do the same thing with the, the Treme, the, the, the history of New Orleans the, the, that you did, just because both of you are telling your tales of, of, of your places from where you came from, two different mediums, but at the same time, two very, very, very unique uh, and, and stories of color. Can you, I'd love to hear those stories. Go for it. Lola, so I'm giving it to you so people don't get tired of my voice. So, <laughs> And you're muted. You're muted, Lola. Lola, you're muted. Gotcha. Okay. When you <laughs> talked about the idea of finding your voice, another thing that I was well aware of was the extent to which um, for more than a century, the Times Picayune had been telling stories of Black people from a very racist perspective. And in addition to writing about what was happening at that very moment, it was also the sense that I had these ancestors on my shoulders, whispering in my ear all of those stories that couldn't have been told before. So I wanted to have a kind of forceful voice, a voice that was insistent and informed by all of this history. Um, but the other thing in terms of voice is something Albert Murray once said. Albert Murray was a, a great American scholar who passed away a few years ago. He said that style is your attitude toward experience. So, you know, it's like you're wearing your white suit and the, the truck passes by and you get mud all over it. Uh, one style that you could have is to be pissed off and be yelling at the bus driver that's just passed. 
or you could otherwise you can laugh at it. And so my voice or my style or my attitude toward experience is also to try to see the humor in it because the depth of these struggles that we've been enduring for generations and that will and all probably continue for generations is such that you have to take it both very seriously and not too seriously. Ultimately, I think um, as you get more comfortable, I think your style is defined by not only what you take from other artists, but what you don't take from other artists. And somewhere in between those two things is your own voice that will develop the more you do this. And I can only say it's not so much that I knew when I had my voice as I knew what I was working toward. And that's, I think, the lesson for all of us is trying to figure out how to keep working toward our voice. Bring it on, Ted. All right, I like I like that. Uh, <laughs> the, humor, the humor is really important. I had a, a, a somebody who was teaching the book, and they're from the Bronx, and they said, uh, you know, this book is good, and it kind of rings true with my students. And they said, but but the thing that they all noticed was this book is hilarious. Like this book is funny in those sort of dark humor ways that like. Like you laugh at stuff and people are, uh, people that aren't in there or in that part of the cult are, are like, that's inappropriate, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh yeah, I nailed that one. I got it. Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think Lola's hit it. It, 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 is, it. it is a hard thing to find your voice, but when you do, you know it. And I think uh, particularly for the second book, you talk about the ancestors, you, I, I mean, in, in the second book, I, I you know, uh, I have Tenskwatawa, Pontiac, uh, Blackhawk, Tecumseh, they're all in there, right, telling stories uh, and helping me to tell stories because I, th I, think, I think it's really important to, to acknowledge that in good ways, but, but not without humor, too, you know, like, I, I mean, I, my, my narrator is like, you know, I, I showed Tecumseh this picture on the phone and he didn't bat an eye, so that was cool, mm. right? So I think about, about it's, the, it's those little things within voice that are important. And I think that's a confidence thing, right? That you're telling it in, in a confident way and people, people respond to that. And you've got to take some risks, I think, uh, as a writer. Um, but there's a moment sometimes, and we get it pretty rarely as writers, but I know you've had it. I know, Walter, I know you've had it. I know you, you write something and you go, oh, damn. Mm. that's good right I like that I like when you can like your own writing I, th I think you've accomplished something um you know I mean yeah yeah you got to work it you got to edit it and massage it and do all that stuff but when you when you can come back to it after after time and go yeah it holds up um that's a that's a real accomplishment I think that that's what you hope to you hope to do and for me I always thought about writing and academic writing um and I always write for for like my dad and my grandpa, and it's, you know, it was always, it would be one word, they would say one word, they would either go sick, or they would be like, <laughs> right? And so they're, those are the two, like, these are smart, these are smart folks, not formally educated folks, but if I can get that across to them and they get it, and mm, then you know, I think that, that you've done something right with your words. Now you both have, um kind of developed in your writings and the stories you present, you kind of bring up the issue of working class people, regular folk. Uh, is there a reason you chose to write in that direction or that goal or why? Well, I'm most interested in, to whatever extent I'm writing for and about some other than myself, I'm interested in writing for and about people who have less of a voice, who don't get a chance to, to, uh, to to have such a large audience. I think about a particular example that was sort of telling in my own career. Um, and a gallery owner in New Orleans put together a book, um, I, I'm sorry, put together a exhibition where he would get decommissioned guns from the New Orleans Police Department and have artists create art with them. And so, you know, the, the exhibition was Artists Against Guns and there were essays to be written about that. And he asked me to write one. And so I wrote an essay in which I talked to a woman who had lost two sons and a nephew to gun violence on the streets of New Orleans. And when I turned the essay in, the, the curator of the exhibit was a little disappointed because he had read my work. He thought that he'd hear more of my voice in the essay. But what I did to whatever extent I could was have this woman do all of the talking, which is not to say she's one of those people who 
uh, is so incredibly articulate, despite not necessarily having her nouns and verbs always agree. No, this was not someone who was necessarily a great talker. But whatever she had to say, however she expressed the pain of her losses would be infinitely more powerful than anything I could say secondarily or tertiarily reflecting on this from some, some, some mountain on high. So I think it's crucial that we allow people to speak for themselves whenever possible. We use our skills so that they can speak through us rather than us speaking for them. Thank you. You got, you got anything, Ted? You want to add to that? Did you want? I mean, did you want to know about about the working class in particular and, and why that's? Well, it it seems like that's the audience that that you're you're. You, those are the people. That's your that's your authentic authenticity, I guess. I or is it? I, I how did you how did you, how did you choose? You know, I mean, you you grow up in a certain way, and you have you have those concerns, and like even your humor is different, right? Where we have different things that we find funny, right? That other people might find inappropriate. And there's a lot to be said about, about how you're raised and, and, and how you come up. But for me, I think, I think about this, I think because I, you know, in teaching literature and, 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 and film and all those things, what gets talked about and what gets looked at, um, you know, you go back in the Western can, you go back, you go back to Shakespeare. It's always about the upper class, it's about nobles and people like that, right? When do working class people get to tell their stories? And I think we get it. We get it generationally, right? We get um, whether it's right contemporary. We think about the shy or shameless. Right? I'm from Chicago, so those are the shows that I'm going to gravitate to. Um, those are shows from the South Side, right? The last time when's the last time the North Side of Chicago had a show? Hmm. Good times. That was the last time the North Side. So it's it's this gentrified place that doesn't that doesn't produce those kinds of things anymore. But but once a generation, whether it's Roseanne. Or it's or it's shameless. Working folks get like one opportunity, right? And it's it's invariably it's better than a lot of the things that are out there. But the bulk of the shows are are Grey's Anatomy, L.A. Law. They're about the professional class. They're not about working class people, right? Occasionally, working folks intersect with them. So to me, the stories that are more interesting, more authentic, have more staying power in the long run are the stories of the working class, right? And so those are the stories that that need to be celebrated more. And how do you do that? You just have to write, you have to write better stories. Cause I can't, I can't watch doctor shows. I can't watch cop shows. I, can't, I mean, seriously, uh, you know, uh, uh, American uh, dramatic television leaves a lot to be desired. So I think, I think there's an authenticity to that people respond to in those stories. And, and with shows like that, more people are on this side of the thing than are on that side of the thing, right? So. Uh, there's objectification on both sides, but which 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 is the better story? If you tell it right, it's the working class story. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's interesting because now you open up a door for me. Um, trying and, and Lois, you started this kind of just, just with your background in the newspaper writing, and Ted, your background as a as a professor at university. I, you guys are kind of the mainstream, so I want you to assess to me. Um, I are our stories, or these stories that we're talking about, getting into the mainstream media, and how would you assess it? Um, I begin most mornings looking at Democracy Now, Amy Goodman's program, which very consciously attempts to give voice uh, to people who otherwise might not have it, but it's not quite mainstream. And I think what ends up happening is when something happens in the community, when all of us, as an example, I did an article in the New York Times about a barbecue guy in Louisville, Kentucky, who was killed amid the protest on, uh, about Breonna Taylor. And it was interesting in that um, I'm not certain that the national media would have been interested in him had it not been for the tragedy of that young lady's death. But nonetheless, that opportunity came in that way. And hopefully I was able to tell, give some sense of what that what his life was like and what he meant to the community, I think we get into into the mainstream infrequently, but um, the times when those stories are indeed so moving and so compelling that they not only get into the mainstream but are celebrated. I'm thinking about like Jesse Lehman, a young black man out of Mississippi whose memoir Heavy is one of the the uh, very oft cited books, or uh, Isabel Wilkerson's recent Cast, which is not so much about individual people, but it's about people who are in the undercast in America. And they 
which she has written says so much about all of us that I think we are all compelled to read it. When I, when I think about those stories, I think about, and, and I think about Standing Rock and how that unfolded and how that took place and how hard it was to get that story into the mainstream media. And I can think about on social media, you know, I have, I have a, I have a Facebook group, right? We're old people. We have Facebook, right? Uh, kids mm -hmm. don't. But uh, it's, there's 25,000 people in this with about 6,000 active members every day, right? And this is a Native Issues group on Facebook. And we have a lit and a film one too. But the issues is, is big because it's a news. I, I sort of curate the day's news, right? But through, through all that time uh, from, from, from Sacred Stone Camp on to, um, to Cannonball and then Standing Rock, you know, there's sort of move changing of how the, the, the terms for the spaces moved over time. Um, every day, almost every day, I or somebody else definitely would tag MSNBC, CNN, ABC, Fox, every major news outlet. Like, do you see what's happening? Do you see what's happening? Mm. You know, we hit them on Twitter. We hit them on, on Facebook. We hit them on Instagram. Everywhere we, we could. Um, and it took months and months and months, and there was nothing. Nobody ever covered any of this until the vets showed up, right? Then it became a sort of national story, right? It started to grow in prominence, and Lawrence O'Donnell covered it. Um, but, but I think what's interesting and what gets lost is that all of the work to make that story known, that's all working, folks, right? That's no, mm -hmm. no professional people. Nobody came in and said, you know, here's a story we should cover. So there's this pressure from the bottom up to get this story covered, right? But to me, it sort of gets swooped and then kind of co-opted at the end. I mean, I, I was grateful to see that the coverage moved into the into the national realm, but I know so many people work just to, just to get it that far. And then the story kind of, you know, because the America has zero attention span is gone. I mean, I, I can remember being a kid reading like Parade Mag, reading long form journalism, which is really, it's just not there. And that was such a fascinating thing growing up um, you know, but I know we've moved away from, from print journalism in, in large ways. So it's important. How do we recapture, how do we recapture that in the digital age, those sort of, those, those important stories and, and the longer form investigative yeah. journalism. Ted, I'd like to, to add something to what you just said, particularly in terms of the evolving Standing Rock coverage. And that is, we as storytellers also need to figure out how to maximize the chance that major media will be interested in the story. And I don't mean that in some sellout sort of way. What I mean is the same kind of criteria you have in trying to tell anyone a story, or for that matter, trying to ask your mom to let you go to the high school dance. You gotta figure out how you're gonna phrase that. And I think that's the job of any writer at any time, in any circumstance, but it's particularly difficult and particularly important for people writing stories that are not obvious shoe ins for the mainstream media to cover. That's an interesting point. Lois, and it also raises, uh, kind of fits in one of the questions we got from the, one of our uh, audience members. In as a writer, is your story or the message you're trying to get, is that something they have to do individually or is there a community mind set or, 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 or like-minded writers that they can use to do what you're talking about? Or what, what, what would you suggest in a, in, for a, a, a writer to follow, what path would they take? Mm. Ted, you want to? Well, I mean, when you when you said you know a group of like-minded writers, it's you know go back to the top of it when, when Jacqueline was talking about independent journalism, right? I mean, I, mm -hmm. I spend a, a lot of time in the evenings out in Portland streets, and I see a lot of independent journalism, and I see um, something changing. I see the concerns of people changing what they want to hear, what they're what versus what they're being fed by, what passes for media nowadays. But I think that. <clears throat> the like-minded people as a group, that consortium journalism, right? That groups of journalists who, who um, are interested in, in certain kinds of stories and who have specialties and ties to communities could definitely move, move the needle forward in journalism in, in a collective sort of way. We've got to rethink the way um, that it worked for the last couple centuries and think about the next and oncoming century. So that might be something to think about. You know, one of the great things about a newsroom is the idea that you're a among a bunch of professionals with whom you can have those kinds of conversations. Well, what do you think of my lead? Or is this a good story? Working independently is more difficult, but I think in some ways you have to assemble 
you're like-minded people yourself. Uh, try to find people whom you can trust. And also from time to time, if you see somebody whose work you admire, write to them and ask them, you know, if you could strike up a conversation with them about some of the issues that you're trying to, to, to reach an understanding of yourself. So now there's a, another element to this story and, and, and I hate to say this, but Jacqueline and, and, and underscore would be an issue of, of, of what we're talking about. There is this, the growth of the nonprofit journalism and those reporting groups. Is that helping the cause, hurting the cause, or how, how does that fit into the bigger picture here? Hmm. Well, I'm on the board of directors of a, uh, a nonprofit digital newsroom called The Lens in New Orleans. And there's some very important stories that we have broken that mainstream media has not broken. Uh, we are partnered with several mainstream media outlets that helps our information get out. Our attitude is that we're not so much proprietary about it, although we would like you to do what often national media don't do, and that is credit us as the source of the story that you then go on to embellish in your own way. I think, um, you know, when you're talking about my biography, a lot of my writing and thinking is about food. I think about those days in which we had uh, regional beers, and for that matter, regional radio stations, where everything wasn't the same everywhere. We're finding now that there are, uh, once again, regional beers that attempt to, to say something about the place where they come from. What I would say about the digital newsrooms is that you end up with the possibility of a greater variety of voices, which is the opposite of what has been happening in American journalism, really for about 50 or 60 years. You see these newspapers, like uh, my own newspaper, the Times Picayune. Well, that used to be the Times, the New Orleans Times, the New Orleans Democrat, the New Orleans States, and the New Orleans Item. Those four papers became one, the Times Picayune, and was then bought by the New Orleans Advocate most recently. So we need these other voices and these other independent nonprofit outlets, because otherwise we're stymied with a, a sort of a funnel approach to what actually gets out in front of the public. And I, I would add, I mean, the, on the nonprofit journalism tip, I would add that the for-profit journalism is the problem that, that, that America has in, in, in droves, right? I mean it's become an entertainment source, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, after 9-11, after when everything became breaking news, it just became a constant source of entertainment. There was no more news at all. So uh, I think the, the nonprofit uh, model, at least in, in spirit, is the way to go. And then you've got, you've got to find funding sources. But, but what I've noticed is, I, I know that, that Lola, she said about, about getting credit for things. I know that some of the footage that I had from here in, in Portland at the sort of beginning of things, uh, you know, late spring, early summer, I would get hit up, you know, can we use your footage? Can in, and in some places I would, yeah, go ahead and use it. But some of these places I looked at and I was like, you know, what are, what are they about? And they're, they're these sort of, not bureaus, but they're these companies that, that repackage things for clients. When they say clients, I'm like, well, this is a for-profit. I'm not giving you my content for, for free. They want the content for free. So there's this, there's this other sort of vulturous kind of media that's out there that's sort of a packaging, uh, you know, a predatory kind of media that I think we, we should be on the lookout for. And then I don't know if they're, you know, mobile PR units or I don't know how they see themselves, but, but that, that's not a good thing. Oh, the other, and the other, and, and taking that in another direction too. Um, I, if I were, and I guess I, I look at, I'm, you know, you guys are quite impressive. You, Lois, you've been a newspaper columnist, and Ted, you're in the academic world, and you got your credentials. If I'm a writer, do I need the credential <laughs> of, of, of even having written for a mass? media or something to get started? And, and, and how would you guys recommend me, the young writer, get started? What you do need as a young writer is an editor or the equivalent of an editor. Somebody to read your work and say, this is good, this is bad, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the credential becomes less important. In, in the old days, a lot of newspaper reporters didn't have uh, uh, college degrees. And in the tech world, you also see again that your knowledge of the tech world is more important than actual credential. What's most important is to be able to have someone who can critique your work for you. 
um, and someone who you trust and someone who has some real knowledge behind it because you don't need an amen corner, you need an actual editor. That's what uh, mainstream newsrooms can do because there's a system uh, that, that is designed to sort of help people develop in that way. But if you can figure out a way to chart your path toward development independently, go for it. Yeah. I mean, in, in the writing world, a lot of it is dependent on MFA. Everybody has an MFA, right? And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, you can uh, send your work off to, to journals and, and magazines. And a lot of time, I mean, you hear, you know, I mean, people will come out and say, well, I used to be an editor at blah, blah, blah. And our, our managing editor said, well, if, if they didn't have MFA after their name, don't even bother reading their stuff. Right? Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so that could, that could be a real problem. I don't have an MFA. I, I just have a, um, the will to keep submitting. So, I mean, you know, I write books and I write and I get asked to write things, but I submit to slush because, uh, it's important not just to get your feelings hurt, but it's, it's important to, you know, okay, I could do better. I could do better. I could do better. So if you don't have an editor, um, you need to employ another method that helps to edit your work, but that editing, like Lola said, is really important. To, you don't you don't need an amen corner. You need you need a hmm, that's not working corner or this is good. Build on this. You you really do need that. So absolutely. So now, as an editor and and having been in that role of of working with writers, a lot of them don't like to be edited. <laughs> that is that, and I'm 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 like when I the slap on the hand is like uh, I have offended and totally, you know. I, I know it's a part of the process. I know how important it is, but many of a young writer just, I'm not, they, don't, they won't accept it. Any words of advice to them? Uh, there's sort of two things to consider about being edited. One is that on any job that you work on, there's a possibility that the boss is gonna ask you to do it in a way that you don't think it should be done. If you want the check, you gotta shut up and do what they say. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that as an artist, you always got to have your mind open to the possibility that you're wrong. And that is, of course, more difficult when you're younger than when you're older because you're not, you haven't had as much experience and you assume that this limited experience you've had is indeed sufficient. But you always got to maintain that possibility, especially if you want to have any integrity in your work. Um, so, and also to the extent to which it takes a lot of ego to put yourself out there, yeah. but you also have to have the humility to listen to what people say about your work. You do, and and for for me, that was one of the things was, uh, thing in in writing. Like I got some, I got a couple tattoos, but one of the the next one I'm getting is a little proofreader mark for delete, right? And I have it right there on my finger because sometimes you just need to delete stuff. You're not as smart or as brilliant as you think you are. Uh, the mm -hmm. the only way you're going to get out of meeting an editor as a young writer is just become an old writer and say whatever you want and don't care if you get published or not. So if you plan to be a writer and you're starting out, uh, plan to be edited. But, but Lois, you said something that's important is that it's somebody that you can trust, right? Mm -hmm. people will, I mean, people, the, the possibility for sabotage does exist. I'm not saying be paranoid about it, but, but know, know your folks and, and, and meet somebody, you know, work with somebody that, that you can trust that has your best interest and, and the writing's best interest at heart too. And, um, and when people are editing or trying to tell you something, uh, you should listen. You, you know, I mean, you never know as an artist what you're going to hear because you have your perspective that you're just kind of, you're driving through it. But, but editors and, and other folks, readers uh, and listeners, they're hearing stuff that you don't and that you have tuned out for yourself. So listen up, definitely. Well, there's that old proverb about you got two ears and one mouth. <laughs> Do more listening than talking, especially when you're younger. <laughs> you know? Yeah, especially. Yep. All right, so I'm going to raise a question from one of uh, one of uh, pe people out in the audience. Uh, as, as, a, as a young writer, or maybe even an old writer, uh, how would I, and how do you recommend that I find my voice? Hmm. How do I get started? I would suggest you read widely, and the people whose work you particularly like read it more because you begin to get the sound of good writing and writing that you like in your ears. And that will help you figure out your own voice. I think that that's probably the surest way that I can come up with. Yeah, you've, if you're gonna be a writer, you have got to be a reader. And 
um, and read widely too. I mean, you know, and I, I, I've always been that kind of a reader. Like, you know, I know, I know that a, a, a one, a one uh, liter shampoo bottle is 33.8 fluid ounces, not because I know metric system, but because I read everything, right? <laughs> Reading widely uh, is, is definitely the way to go. And if you find somebody that you like, I mean, you don't, you're not gonna, you're not gonna copy them, but, but you, you know, there's something about them that, that you, what is it that you like about that writer, you know, and read that writer in, in depth and, and critically and find out what it is because in, within yourself, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to activate that thing, right? There's mm -hmm. something that's speaking to you in that writing. So definitely uh, you gotta do, but you gotta be, you gotta be a reader. I see these debates on Twitter people are like, well, do I really need a reader of a lot of books to be a good writer? <laughs> if you're asking that question, I, I really don't want to read this stuff. So the uh, the other question that comes up, and, and this, this again is kind of related to what you talked about before. Um, as a writer, do I take the journalistic route or do I take the uh, uh, literature? You know, uh, what, what, what is the better way to get my, my credit? <laughs> I'm laughing because in the old days, there were a whole lot of jobs for newspaper reporters, meaning just in terms of how do you keep uh, the wolf from the door while you're honing your craft, newspapers made sense. Well, newspapers are declining in a lot of ways, even if you argue that their death is not imminent, certainly the size of the newsroom, the number of jobs is a lot, a lot lower. Um, but I really think a lot of that is an economics question how can you support yourself while you learn to write? MFA programs are great if you got the time and energy to do that. Um, writing independently, uh, writing literarily is great, provided you've got some method to get, to be strong enough as a writer so that magazines and, and book publishers will be interested in your work. You have to figure out how, uh, how to, to, to support yourself while you're improving on your, your ability. In, 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 in the literary world or in the fiction world, there, there are ways to do that um, that can sort of benefit you as a writer. Um, you can get paid to read things. You can do paid reviews. Uh, you, there, are, there are workshops that I know tons of writers, um, folks like Gabino Iglesias, Richard Thomas, that they do workshops that are really pretty inexpensive, just kind of covering costs. They do a lot of scholarships about how to market, how to pitch, all those things that you need to know how to do those things. If you want this to be your craft and, and your, and your bread and butter, you got to know how to pitch a story. Um, you know, you got to have your synopsis. There are, there are, there are, there are tricks to the trade that are learnable um, either through your library or through workshops or, 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 or whatever um, your preferred method is. But yeah, you can, you can start to make a little bit of scratch by doing the things that you'd like to do around writing. And then uh, you can progress into longer form. And, the, in the digital world, I mean, uh, Vice, Atlantic, all of them, they're always, they're, they're open for pitches, especially uh, in, in uh, ethnic, uh, creative nonfiction, things like that. They're looking for stories from folks. So if that's what you're looking to do, learn how to pitch and then pitch your story. Great, okay. Now, and from the, from the uh, just to bring this back full circle, earlier we talked about uh, the need for the mainstream to put their stories out there, but as a mainstream editor, we very seldom heard from the community and from writers like you or, or who, who would send us story ideas and or, or efforts. So how do we get more people to get involved in that part of it? I mean, the only reason that the mainstream will start printing is if they know about you, if, if they don't hear about you. What can writers do or what, what can we do to bridge that gap? I think that really is an issue of relationships. Um, in defense of the mainstream media, when you're a reporter or an editor at a mainstream publication TV show, you're being bombarded with uh, potential stories from press people, from, uh, from people in the community. And you really are trying to figure out the easiest, quickest way to say no, because you already have a lot on your mind. But if you as a member of the community or as a young writer can find a couple of people who you can develop a relationship with, and they know that when you call them, you're not gonna keep them on the phone all day. You're gonna make your point, try to convince them there's a good story. And if they don't like it, then move on. That kind of relationship, I think is a way to maximize your chance of getting uh, either 
you as a writer getting published in these media or you as a community member getting uh, the stories that you want to be told, told. Great. Did you want to add, you didn't want to add anything or did you Ted? No, I, I just, I just, I think um, that the relationship piece is key uh, in, in both in journalism and, and in fiction. I mean, you can develop relationships with folks uh, that, that, that are really important and they're going to be looking out for your story if they know your story or they'll know people that will be looking for that story. So definitely communication and, and relationships are important too. Gentlemen, this has been a pleasure. I have learned so much about and, and, and getting to meet you two and getting to know you two has been just wonderful. And I've been reading, about, reading your works on the background and it's just been a pleasure on this side. So on behalf of little old me, I'm gonna say Theodore C. Van Alps Jr. And Lois, Eric, Eli, thank you so much. And we will hand it back over to you, Ms. Sheila Hart. <laughs> thank you so much. That was a really, a fascinating conversation. I appreciate that, all of you. Um, thank you for everybody who came tonight and listened and for joining us and making donations and Walter, Lois, and Ted. Um, really appreciate your contribution to the, this conversation. Um, in a couple of weeks on October 14th, we're going to be hearing from Kevin Aberask, who's the managing editor for Indians.com and also from Mary Annette Pember, who's a national correspondent for Indian Country Today, talking about um, indigenous uh, news and what it takes to be heard. Um, and this has been also live streamed on Indians, which is Indian with a Z.com. Mm -hmm. And there's a recording of this as well, if anybody wants to share this later. So um, thank you so much. Thank you, Walter, for your good job as moderator and your tie, and um, take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, take care. Good to meet you. Take care now. Bye-bye.